Welcome, everybody, to John Berryman at 100. I'm Saskia Hamilton, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of my colleagues in the Barnard and the Columbia English Departments and the Columbia Heyman Center for the Humanities, um, and also on behalf of the Poetry Society of America and Farrah Strauss and Giroux. I'm just here to give you a brief sense of the day and the evening. Uh, in the uh, beautiful introduction to his new selection of Berryman's poems, The Heart is Strange, Daniel Swift writes that John Berryman saw birthdays as imaginative opportunities. The imaginative opportunity of today's events celebrate both Berryman's centenary and the publication by FSG of four new volumes, Daniel Swift's selected poems, as well as editions of Berryman's sonnets introduced by April Bernard, 77 dream songs introduced by Henri Cole, and the complete dream songs introduced by Michael Hoffman. We at Barnard and Columbia are, of course, honored to help host a tribute to Berryman since Columbia had such a marked effect on Berryman's life and education, from his thinking about Shakespeare to his lifelong friendships with Robert Giroux and others. And since, of course, he honors the university by being one of its alumni. The program is wholly curated by Sharif Shanahan and Alice Quinn of the Poetry Society of America, so huge thanks to them. Uh, <laughs> The PSA was founded in 1910 and is the nation's first organization dedicated solely to poetry. Uh, through their signature program, Poetry in Motion, the PSA has presented poems on the subways and buses of New York City and other cities around the country for more than 30 years and are even now on the back of the Metro cards. Um, and they also present innovative literary programs around the country every year. The format for the day is as follows. Um, there will be three panels. Um, first will be about 35 minutes, um, and it will begin immediately after I step away from here till about 3.50, um, with Rachel Hades and uh, Daniel Swift, Swift, moderated by, um, I think Rachel, oh, a, oh you, that's wonderful, um, A. Van Jordan, thank you. Um, from 4 p.m. to 4.50, with April Bernard, Henri Cole, and A. Van Jordan, moderated by Alice Quinn. And from 5 to 5.50, with Kathy Park Hong, Lawrence Joseph, and Kevin Young, moderated by Rachel Zucker. Uh, there will be a public reception from six to seven, and that will be followed by a public reading with many participants. So huge thanks to all the people who have make, make, helped make this day possible with labor, labors, sorry, excuse me, labors, large and small, um, our panelists and readers, um, again, Sharif Shanahan and Alice Quinn at the PSA, um, who had the idea to organize the celebration and brought it to us at Columbia and Barnard. Jonathan Galassi, Jeff Soroy, and Sarah Skiri of FSG. Um, the great people of the Heyman Center for the Humanities, including its director, Mark Mazar, and um, Eileen Galuli, its program manager, Sarah Monks, and Nicholas Oborn. Sarah Pasadino and Bruce Ross in the Barnard English Department, Tiffany Dugan, Amanda Gates Elston, and the good staff of Barnard's Events Management, as well as the staff of Instructional Media and Technical Services, and the staff of Barnard Facilities, who uh, set this up before we arrived, and we'll break it down after we leave. I would want to voice one enormous thanks to all of those good people. And I hope you'll join me in welcoming Rachel Hades, Daniel Swift, and A. Van Jordan to the first panel. So um, welcome uh, to the first panel for today. Um, we have um, two panelists. I'm just going to be basically keeping time and um, fielding questions from you guys as much as possible. Um, I'm just going to set the timer here. I've been running around for the past uh, 20 minutes or so on Columbia's campus trying to find this. Uh, this room, <laughs> so I'm catching my breath here. Okay, so uh, I'm A. Van Jordan. Um, I work at Rutgers University, Newark, um, and I'm honored to be able to introduce these two 
panelists today. Uh, Rachel Hannes is the author of more than a dozen books of poetry, essays, and translations. Her most recent books are a 2011 memoir, Strange Relation, um, by Paul Dry Books, and a 2012 collection of poems, The Golden Road, of Northwestern University Press. Two new books are forthcoming, Talking to the Dead, Selected Prose, from, is it, I know I'm in New York, but is it Sputin? Spite and Dival. Spite and Dival, next fall. Um, and a book of poems, Questions in the Vestibule, from Northwestern University Press next spring. Uh, Richard Hollis's awards include a Guggenheim Fellowship, the O.B. Hardest and Poetry Prize from the Folger Shakespeare Theater, and an award in literature from the American Academy Institute of Arts and Letters. She is a Board of Governors Professor of English at Rutgers University, Newark, where I'm lucky enough to have her as my colleague. Daniel Swift is a literary journalist and critic. He is the author of Shakespeare's Common Prayers, the Book of Common Prayer, and Elizabeth H., which came out in 2012, and The Bomber County, uh, the Poetry of a Lost Pilot's War, which, also, which came out in 2010. He is, and we're also grateful for this, uh, the editor of the Farrar strauss Jarrell's John Berryman Centennial Volume, The Heart is a Strange, The Heart is Strange, New Selected Poems. He teaches at the New College of the Humanities in London. Um, so we're gonna let them just start and they'll, they'll uh, talk for like, I think 15 minutes or so. And 13, they 13 to 15. <laughs> so there was three of us before, so it's now down to two. So, um, and then we'll open it up for questions. So I think we'll start with uh, Daniel. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for, um, to everyone at Barnard for inviting uh, me and us to be here. Um, we've been asked to, to speak about um, my Berriman, about our own Berriman. And I think that's a, a perfect topic um, for this particular poet, since it seems to me that he invites a very particular kind of response from his readers. Uh, most recently, the way I've been encountering Berriman has been in the role of editor, which is a particular relationship, I think, to a, to a poet or to any author. And I would be curious to hear what Kevin Young, who I think is speaking later, uh, who has also edited a lovely selection of Berriman's poetry for the Library of America series, if he has similar kinds of um, thoughts on this topic. But it seems to me that what Berriman in particular asks from his readers is a depth of personal response which can become a very intense love or identification, but can also become a kind of possessiveness. And I felt that both in things that have been written, things that I've asked the other introducers, for example, to write about Berriman for the reissues, and things that also have been written by other authors, asked by FSG to contribute to works on their website about kind of responses to Berriman. I've been struck by the personal tone by those. The flip side of that has been in some of the reviews, interestingly, of the Berriman reissues. I felt a kind of personal response as if people have been saying, you know, hands off my Berriman. You know, who is this Daniel Swift? Why does he think it's his Berriman? This should be my selection. So that personality, that sense of, of my Berriman seems to me a very useful way of thinking about this particular poet. Um, my own personal Berriman remains the one who he was when I first found him, and that's probably true for many of us also. And I was working on a PhD on Shakespeare at Columbia, just across the road. And while I was working on that, it was taking many, many years, uh, I was given a copy of the 77 Dream Songs, which I immediately loved, as I think many of us probably did when first reading them. And the one thing I knew about Berriman, someone must have told me this, was that he was also, as well as being this wild and extraordinary poet, a very serious scholar of Shakespeare. And that mattered to me at the time, in part because it seemed, and again, I'm sure many of us have had this experience, as if he was in some way speaking to me particularly. So not only did I identify with the poetry, I also identified with the idea of this man as a critic and scholar of Shakespeare. That it mattered to me is uninteresting. I'm, I'm raising it now because I think it did matter intensely to Berriman also. I'm not saying simply that Shakespeare mattered to Berriman, although I'll come back to that. I'm, I'm sure that Shakespeare did matter very much to Berriman. It was actually Shakespeare's scholarship and the academic study of Shakespeare that seemed to be intensely important to Berriman. Those first 77 dream songs are saturated with Shakespearean turns of phrase. And they're not really allusions, but they're kind of mirror allusions. They're things that sound like they might be quotations from the plays, but if you look closely at them, they turn out not to be they turn out to be almost quotations, or pastiche. 
So Henry suffers from a brain on fire. And I think when he does so, he's also King Lear, who is bound upon a wheel of fire. That play, King Lear, is crucial for the dream songs. There's a phrase repeated in the dream songs, thumbs into eyes, which doesn't actually ever get spoken in King Lear, but is a, a gloss of one of the crucial bits of action in King Lear. And again, Henry asks, who's king these knights? Which is a kind of King Lear in miniature in many ways. Again, it's not quite the way the question is worded in the play. The other repeated echo in the dream songs is Macbeth. And that also makes a huge amount of sense. Macbeth is a great play of insomnia and worry and anxiety. And it echoes through all of the dream songs. Um, my favorite echo is in the 48th dream song, when Henry is described as Cordor uneasy. Um, Cordor is a place in Scotland and a title. And he's uneasy for good reason if we remember what happens to both of the Thane of Cordors in Macbeth. They both get killed violently. So he's remembering something that relies upon our knowledge of the play but isn't exactly a quotation from the play. There's something more than this, though. Again, this is an obvious point. Many poets have loved Shakespeare. Surely more poets have loved Shakespeare than poets who have been uninterested in Shakespeare. <laughs> but I think Berriman's love for Shakespeare approximates something like a scholar's love rather than necessarily a poet's love. And I'm going to try and explain what I mean to try and explain what, who my Berriman is. There was a kind of restlessness about Berriman. And we can feel that very much in the dream songs and in the biography, but also in his scholarship. He was a devoted scholar, and if you read his biography or look at his scholarship, you can see how much time he spent writing and thinking about Shakespeare. But he also saw, very healthily, that scholarship can turn to pedantry quite quickly. And this is an important point. Berriman's skepticism about scholarship wasn't the kind of anti-academic ridicule that crops up in a huge amount of 20th century poetry. It's a gentler, and this is the crucial thing, more familiar kind of mockery. So in one of the dream songs, he mentions the MLA, the Modern Languages Association. And he also mentions a couple of times the distinction between assistant and associate professors. So he's conscious about that distinction. He's making a joke about the distinction. He is very aware of, and assumes his readers are aware of, the mechanics and the institutions of academic scholarship. And he's generous about it. He's funny about it, but it's a crucial distinction between a simple mockery and, and some kind of gentler, more familiar sort of tone. The flip side of that, the flip side of that mockery, and this is very rare, is that Berriman genuinely has a sense of the thrill of academic scholarship, its excitement and its urgency. It's not only that Shakespeare mattered to him, and Shakespeare did matter to him, it's that the scholarly study of Shakespeare mattered to him. In a very, very late poem, this is February 1970. Berriman writes, I'm hot these 20 years on his collaborator in the taming of the shrew. Now, you could say that's ridiculous. Why would anyone care for 20 years about who Shakespeare's co-author of the taming of the shrew is? I don't think Berriman's being wry or ironic here. I think he really means this. I think he's really saying one could spend 20 years being hot on that question, the question of co-authorship of Shakespeare. He really, truly cares about it. In another late poem, this is addressed to his daughter, and I'm taking these poems from um, John Haffenden's collection, Henry's Fate, which is the sort of um, very late poetry that's collected. Berriman writes, again, this is about his daughter, I love my living one, and there is art, there is scholarship, the finding of things out, there is my wife and baby daughter. And it's that sense for me, the sense of finding things out, bound up with his life, with his wife and his daughter, that I think is central to Berriman's sense of academic scholarship and also the study of Shakespeare. You could equally say, I think, that, that Berriman is one of the great poem, poets of, uh, of being a parent, and particularly that the, the relationship between fathers and children is always on his mind. Um, it's sometimes hard to read the literary criticism of previous generations. Literary criticism tends to age very, very quickly. And some of Berriman's scholarly concerns look a little dated now, to be entirely honest. Um, I'll give you two brief examples, well, three examples. Um, Berriman's big dream, his desire, was to create a single definitive edition of King Lear. And scholars don't do that anymore. The latest idea of Shakespeare scholarship is to print King Lear in multiple rival editions. It's true of several plays. It's a crucial recent turn in Shakespeare scholarship. 
Berryman believed that what he could find was the perfect thing that Shakespeare originally intended, so a single perfect King Lear. And I'm going to come back to why I think that's a very powerful and important dream, but in particular, Berryman believed that not only he could recover Shakespeare's original intentions and desires, Shakespeare's original wishes, he could recover them if he stared hard enough at the mess of variant editions and versions of King Lear. So textual scholarship, there is nothing drier than textual scholarship, for Shakespeare, was, for, for Berryman rather, was an incredibly warm pursuit of the original desires of this single person he thought was such an important poet. Berryman was also interested, I've already mentioned this, in Shakespeare's collaborators, the people who wrote Shakespeare's plays with him. This is a crucial question now for scholars, so that's a question that has not aged in the least. And the other example of something that Berryman was interested in, which remains important, is chronology. Again, these are dry scholarly concerns, but Berryman saw that the chronological sequence of the plays, the order in which they were written, was crucial to their interpretation. And that remains a vital question for Shakespeare scholars now. The great Shakespeare scholar Margareta de Grazia is writing a book about precisely that now, the way that the chronology of the plays entirely changes our interpretation of those plays. That's something that Berryman was obsessed with a very long time ago. But what remains powerful for me in Berryman's Shakespeare work is less to do with his choice of subjects and more to do with his style of thinking. And to illustrate what I mean by that, I actually want to read a little bit from uh, the beginning of Berryman's great essay, which was also a lecture, called Shakespeare at 30. And I warmly recommend to all of you the, um, the collected volume, again, by John Haffenden of, the, um, of, of Berryman's Shakespeare work, which is what I'm drawing this from. So I just want to read the beginning of this essay or lecture by Berryman. Suppose with me a time, a place, a man who was waked, risen, washed, dressed, fed, congratulated on a day in latter April long ago, about April the 22nd, say, of 1594, a Monday. Whether in London, in lodgings, or at a friend's, or a tavern, a small house in the market town Stratford, some hundred miles by miry ways northwest, or at Titchfield House, a little closer southwest, or elsewhere, but somewhere in England, at the height of the Northern Renaissance, a different world. Alone, at some hour, in one room, his intellectual and physical presence not as yet visible to us, although we know its name, seated or standing, high lone in thought. He is 30 years old today and few enjoy this jolt from decade to decade. It would be an error to imagine him very young. Quite apart from the fact that I think that's beautiful writing that anyone could learn from, there's all sorts of things going on in that passage that moves me as someone who has tried to write about Shakespeare. Berriman's focus upon the biographical, I should say this at the beginning, in particular the biographical explanations for the contents of the plays, runs directly counter to the main trend of literary scholarly orthodoxy of the last 50 years. But Berriman's not really, at this point, doing anything that's attempting, I think, to be, to be objective or to be coldly scholarly. He is giving us his Shakespeare, just as we're talking about my Berriman. He's giving us his Shakespeare. And it's worth noting as a kind of biographical side note, for those of us who are familiar with Berriman's biography, Berriman's childhood and family life is Hamlet, right? It's exactly the same plot line. So that sense of an intense identification runs very deep, I think, in his engagement with Shakespeare. But there are three things that m move me in what Berriman does with Shakespeare. The first is a kind of force of sympathetic identification, both Berriman sympathetically identifying with Shakespeare and Berriman forcing us to identify sympathetically with Shakespeare. The second is to do with the hearing of voices and the idea that we can actually know this man. I think it's a crucial point, and it's one I think that literary critics try to skirt around because it's a little in undignified in some way. It sounds like we're conducting a seance rather than doing something importantly scholarly, but I think it's a crucial part of literary scholarship. Third is the role imagination. We might call it fiction also, and this extract here sounds to me like it's from a novel rather than a work of dry scholarly criticism. But it's the crucial role that the imagination plays in literary criticism. Those are the three things that I think make Berriman a great, great Shakespeare scholar, as well as a wonderful poet. And those are the three factors that make up my Berriman.
Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Alice and Saskia and the PSA and everybody who contributed to putting this event together. Can you so I expect to learn a lot today, more than I know. I was saying to Daniel that I don't really know that much about Berryman. He said, you're not supposed to say that yet. But I, he's already said it in the sense that there are not Berryman specialists, that we each have our own Berryman. But looking at any important poetry newly is going to yield some dividends. And I first became aware of Berryman in the 60s. So for somebody my age who remembers how the work struck her piecemeal about 50 years ago, some things about the poems seem different this time around. Um, the poems are familiar, but also not. Their originality and strangeness are more evident to me now that I know more about 20th century poetry than I did. But in some ways, they also ring so true to a distracted academic urban sensibility that they seem a little less strange and outlandish than they did in the 60s. And I have a feeling that other people have had this experience as well. Sort of, he's postmodern or he's tweeting or something avant la lettre in some way. Um, maybe it's as if I've caught up, as if we have caught up to Berryman's idiolect, that slang that, as Lowell says in a little sentence I'm going to quote in a minute, a slang that no one ever spoke, and yet is so expressive of some of the fractures we endure as we go through our days trying to attend to too many things at once. So I've had this sense of recognition. It's been a pleasure to dip back into Berryman, though I can't say it's been a relaxing experience. I keep thinking of that line, his thought made pockets and the plane bucked, like that. So Adam Kirsch, writing in TLS very recently, had this to say, I'm just going to quote very briefly from Kirsch, from Lowell, and from Elizabeth Bishop on Berryman. Berryman, who spent so many years waiting for genius to find him, eventually lured it by making the waiting around with all its attendant boredom, guilt, and vice the very subject of his poetry. He used every technique of artifice, in diction, syntax, allusion, rhythm, to create a voice of shocking honesty and directness. And by achieving this paradox, he liberated himself from the impersonality of high modernism. I was going to read later this afternoon Berryman's poem, The Animal Trainer, which is a beautiful poem, but it is so Yeatsian that I couldn't quite stand to do it. And indeed, Kirsch says in this same essay, the animal trainer is a perfect example of the pre-Berryman Berryman, that he hadn't quite found his voice yet. You have the same thing in early Larkin and in early Howard Nemiroff, for example. Here is Wallace Stevens, or here is Yeats, or whatever. Lowell talks of the dream songs as a spooky, <coughs> spooky, maddening work of genius or half genius in John's later obscure, tortured, wandering style, full of parentheses, slang no one ever spoke, jagged, haunting, lyrical moments. And then, I think my favorite of these three passages is Elizabeth Bishop saying, I believe in a letter, I am sure he is saying something important, perhaps something too personally, which is what she also felt about a lot of Lowell's work. And then, wonderful little things in places, the glitter of broken glasses, smashed museum cases, something like that. We're going to come back to that sort of glitter. So I have several quick vignettes of my Berrymans, very different from Daniel's wonderful exposition of Berryman as a Shakespeare scholar, which was very good for me to hear. One is that a fellow editor on the Harvard Advocate, and this would have been around 1968, um, was writing poems about his love affairs. This was an, a young man having what I think now were fairly uncomplicated love affairs, but he was so influenced by Berryman that he couldn't really help writing the way Berryman wrote about love affairs. And it strikes me now, 50 years later, that Berryman was writing out of a much more complicated life and sensibility. But the lesson that young poets only learn later is that style is one thing and temperament or sensibility is something else. When you're young and you're full of imitative fervor, you can't help writing in a certain way. So these were sonnets about a, a nervous urban love affair. And for some reason, they've stuck with me. I think that we all took Berryman's tremendous originality as sort of a given. Oh, that's one way to write poetry. And then we started writing like that, or some of us did. Probably the guys more. Um, another 
more recent perception of Berryman, thinking about the plain bucking and those broken glasses, it strikes me now, reading through the dream songs, that he doesn't miss anything at all. But in order to accommodate each glance and each bucking of the plane, each hiccup and nightmare and digressive memory, he needs to shatter his surface so that the shards are what we have. I don't want to quote at great length, but the famous poem, the famous dream song that begins, filling her compact and delicious body with chicken paprika. But it's the next line that gets me. She glanced at me twice. Um, and then I hungered back, fainting with interest, I hungered back. So he's in a restaurant, I think, or at a crowded dinner table, but he doesn't miss a glance. He doesn't even miss when a rabbit on the lawn gives alert and wily glances to the folks sitting on the porch. And it must have been nerve wracking to never be able to miss anything. No doubt he missed something, but I think he missed less than a lot of people did. So he needs to shatter his surface, and we have something like a mosaic but the shards are held in suspension in a net or container of diction that seems to me now amazingly muscular and dependable. We could think about Shakespeare again, that no, no matter how difficult a passage is, the syntax is going to work if we'll just have the patience to follow it. Or maybe those shards scatter out, but in a pattern of almost reliable elegance. I mean, it's nothing like the centrifugal quality of a poet like Ezra Pound, whose syntax really will not reward your attention very often. <laughs> so it seems to me that the centripetal energy of a sonnet exerts a kind of countervailing force against the centrifugal scattering of attention. The attention's all over the place, but the form can be relied on to sort of bind it together. So Berryman's searchlight, the searchlight of that insomniac non-stopping mind is contained, whether you want to say in a net or a sort of a globe or bowl or some kind of a vessel. Um, another thing about Berryman, which is not going to be original to say, and I think I always felt this, but I, I notice it a lot looking back, is these indispensable lines. I believe Henri Cole talks about some of them in his beautiful preface. Um, I can't remember when they became indispensable, but I always liked them lady poets must not marry pal. Um, life friends is boring, we must not say so. And some more recent ones like bats have no bankers and they do not drink. Um, when worst things got, how was you, steady on. And there are many, many of them are the first lines of dream songs, but not always. Robert Frost said that he wanted to lodge a few poems where they would be hard to get rid of, which makes me think of splinters under your fingernails or seeds between your teeth. It's a kind of a nasty image. It's full of animus, the way Frost was. And Berryman lodges his lines, his shards, his splinters, where we can't get rid of them. But I think a kinder way to look at it is that they, they continue to reward us and to strike us with their tremendous truth. They're, they're not relaxing but they're actually helpful. And finally, my Berryman, a few quick themes that came to me this time around, um, that he writes so beautifully about animals. Of course, the bats are also people, but he writes well about encounters with raccoons and rabbits in the suburbs. Three coons come at his garbage, he be cross. Um, that dark brown rabbit lightness in his ears, and he really inhabits the rabbit. He writes about <coughs> two dogs attached to each other in the middle of the street and we had to call the vet to separate them. I think he liked dogs a lot. He has this dream song that ends, me, wag. So he was a, he was a great animal lover in his own way. The glances I spoke about, she glanced at me twice, a beautiful dream song that begins in a blue series, which I believe is about dreaming about love affairs and marriages, but he's thinking of a series of blue-eyed glances about growing old. Um, Berryman didn't grow terribly old by my standards now, but I'm paying much more attention than I did to the dream songs about growing old. And they have a kind of a human wisdom that some of the perhaps better known ones might not have. I'm reading one of them later. And finally, um, some of the dream songs really read like condensed novellas or short stories. I was recently rereading Eileen Simpson's memoir, Poets in Their Youth, and I'd, I'd forgotten or hadn't known that Berryman was quite a serious fiction writer in his youth. And he has, for example, a dream song that begins, 
about that me, where someone comes up to him after a lecture or a reading and wants to go to his office and talk to him, and she breaks down in tears, and he seems to behave very well. He sort of says, she cried, I cried, then I said, what was it you wanted to say to me? And she says, nothing. And the poem ends, I am her. So a tremendous fund of sympathy and wisdom, which again, I think can often get glossed over if we focus too much on the, the crazy jaggedness of it. So um, I think that's about it for me. Van hasn't called the time yet. Well, okay. I didn't want to interrupt that. Thanks. <laughs> So we, we officially have one minute, but I think we started a little late, so I think we have about five minutes for <laughs> questions from anyone or everyone all at once. Can I ask a question? Absolutely, please. Um, I love the idea, the, the, the idea of things lodging, and I wonder... Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Like splinters. Yeah. I love the idea of lodging like splinters. I, wonder if it's connected, and this is to, to, to in some ways to, to contradict the idea of it being like splinters, but it can connect to Berriman's sense of humor, which many of those, for me, though, many of those memorable lines are also funny. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. that, has a, that has a role to play in the process of logic. Well, that would take us maybe into the territory of the joke-like quality of some of the dream songs. Um, and I, I mean that in the best way, not the kind of very flat, disappointing free verse poem, which kind of has a punchline, and you think, eh, at least I do. But yeah. Humor is very hard to anatomize and pin down, but do you mean that the, the individual lines are funny or the whole context of the poem and then it rises to sort of a climax of humor? Or, because, I mean, these, some of these lines are detachable. Life, friends, is boring, we must not say so. I mean, the whole poem is wonderful, but you can quote that one line, or them lady poets must not marry, pal, or the MLA at Christmas tide, hey, I had a student who wrote a paper a couple of years ago about Berryman's academic poems, and I know that, is, is it your preface that talks about his, no, it's Michael Hoffman's that talks about, he has poems about proctoring exams, he has poems about giving lectures on mornings when he has an upset stomach and is hungover, he has a poem about the MLA. That, that is very funny. Not all so gentle, maybe, as you say about academia. But he's, I think the humor helps make Berryman very immediate. Even now, yeah. Yes. I think Rachel has a She's asking whether um, Rachel is asking whether when I encountered Berryman's work in the 60s, it felt like an invitation or a model of something I could do. And I think it should have, but I don't think I was inclined that way. I certainly paid attention and it may have seeped in. But some of my male cohorts in the poetry world at that time, I think in some way felt like they had more permission to do this. It's a good question that I'll keep thinking about. Maybe one more. No need. Yeah, uh, just to continue that in terms of your writing as a poet. So now that you spend some more time with Berryman, now reading him, is there something that excited you about him that you thought as a poet? Oh, yeah. Or, or, oh, absolutely. And, and partly, I was thinking of this this morning. I don't know if it's true, but I think that he is very Shakespearean, but I almost think his syntax and his verbal energy take the place of imagery. It's not that the images are so gorgeous, though there are gorgeous images. There's something acrobatic and muscular about the language. And I also really like this idea of a detachable line. It's nice to know that years after one's death, a single line of poetry might continue to radiate a lot of energy. And I, I find that that works with reading almost any poems, or if people say to me, I love that line in your poem, where are you? And they might only remember that one line. That's how poetry works. So, um, yeah, I, I more may have filtered in, but right now, just that sense of the muscular syntax and the detachable line. Yeah. Anything else? Is that it? Thank you, guys. <laughs>